Hi everyone, uh, this is Eric Vasquez, uh, mechanical engineering student, senior, uh, tend to graduate spring of 22 now. Uh, this video is going to be more of a tutorial or introduction on CAD analysis and design for our project for a real electric car team. Uh, purpose of this is to make sure that we reduce the amount of error possible and do some design planning and analysis ahead of time without having to buy new parts and new components. So I'll just go over a quick intro. So there's going to be like more conceptual understanding of what we're doing versus like more solid works. So you understand the background before actually doing it because background research is what helps you get to your final product. So, uh, what is it? I have a new, okay. Uh, goals of this project. So I'll just go over, uh, overall the slideshow from the last meeting. Uh, I just went over general tasks, what needs to be done, research for mounting of the motor, research for cross section of the transmission, etc., etc. because all this is important for the next steps in the design. And overall the semester, we want to make sure that we can have a structural and dynamic analysis of what we have and what we plan to move on to the car. So a good way to do this is conceptually understand how our car works and what the initial skills we need to make sure that we can test our new changes. So what I mean by that is for this specific tutorial, we're going over spring and dampening system in our car. So we want to make sure that we can test what we have now or the idea of it so that when we have more accurate values for our final design, we can go back and say, okay, we already know how to test this. I can just send someone, Hey, watch this video, go ahead and test it. Let me know what values we have and say, okay, based on these parameters, we need a spring of this and this uh, characteristics. And here's a list of what I found online just based off of what we need from our simulation. So stuff like that is super important, helps us get straight to the point because we can't do testing in person and buy and spend, buy and spend. So yeah, so basically right now we're on just a spring system, spring and dampening system. And uh, next later on, we'll go over uh, motor mounting and transmission and torque analysis. So right now it's just gonna be the simple thing like can our springs uh in our car handle the weight that we're going to add on to it so there's going to be a simple analysis of that so how do you do that to begin with how do you test a spring dampening system like it's super complex if you look at pictures and vehicles it can be very overwhelming to look at and it can be a whole dynamic issue but really you just got to understand your suspension system is there to make sure that it reduces the vibrations in your vehicle and on the components in the vehicle because vibrations can lead to parts getting loosened over time and falling apart while you're driving. So we don't want that. And as well, it just makes it more enjoyable ride for the driver so that they can keep their hands steady and no craziness will occur while driving. You want safety. So this is more of a safety factor than anything else. So what does it do? Wheels are always in contact with the ground. That's what you want to reduce vibrations. And you want it so that when, let's say you do reach a bump in the road, you're almost steady in stagnant position. So the way you can visualize this is this is where you are and your wheel is doing this, always touching the road. So how does that happen? You have a spring compress so that when it reaches a bump, it comes up to the vehicle and then it just stretches out to keep in contact with the road at all times possible. So you need very strong springs and it's always moving in a linear motion. So it's not really swiveling or moving back and forth and everywhere. You want this to be a linear motion uh, to make sure everything's super steady. Uh, so what do you do? Create constraint for that. So in this slide, you can see that some issues in design analysis is trying to predict what your motion study is gonna do. So on this right angle or this right side where you can see this little cross section saying a no, uh, if you were just to say, okay, mass of a car, a spring, and then a fixed position to show that it's always in contact with the ground, you run this in simulation. If you're even a tad bit off center, because realistically nothing is going to be perfectly on center, you're going to deal with, uh, what is it, buckling of the spring. It's just going to warp and act like a loose string, just loosely moving around a mass. So you don't want that. If you set up the constraints perfect in SolidWorks, you'll end up with something uh, on the right hand side where these blue lines represent constraints of motion that we set and the one on the right represents a physical object that we create to make sure that the object doesn't move. I'll show an example of both in here. I'll just 
create the first example and then edit it to be the second one. Both work the same, but you want it to match what you have realistically in real life to get more accurate values. So over this whole thing, we're going to go over measurements and clearances. We're going to go over assembly, maids, contacts, fix versus floats, and then motion analysis with gravity, spring dampening and material, and then even show you how you can do stress analysis, but not too heavily or reliant because it does come with some issues. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the first segment. So what is that five minute explanation? Uh, I'll just do like this to signify like that's the end of this section and now we're going to move on to actually creating our part to create this system to represent the wheel uh, spring mass suspension system of a car. So let's go in, SolidWorks, create a part. Let's just create the base. The base doesn't really matter our geometric decisions or like too much uh, what we want. We're going to just keep it in inch, pound, and seconds, which is uh, our units that were signified down here in the bottom right corner. And yeah, we'll just make it something similar to what we'd see in a car. So what do we have is like, usually your spring is like about this size. So it's like a diameter of a couple inches, maybe four, three inches, something like that. So we'll just make our base five inches, five inches. I think that works. Go on the top. I'll make it rectangular. It doesn't really matter. Or if you want, I could make it spherical to match it, I guess. But I'll just make it rectangular. I'll make it seven inches, seven inches. And then I'm going to coincide the corner with the center. So the only reason I'm doing this is to make sure that my dimensions are completely com fully defined in a sense. It even says it down here, fully defined. So that uh, typically more complex designs and assembly you could run into a lot of issues when you start editing and moving things around uh, where something you intended to not change in dimensions could change uh, because you didn't fully define it. So you want to make sure your sketches are fully defined and they have an outline of a black line because from what we saw before, they're usually blue showing that there is some uh, degree of freedom in how it's going to move and uh, represent itself in your design. So I'm going to just constrain it. It's fully defined and I'm going to extrude it straight here to maybe be doesn't matter. I'll just say an inch because this is just our fixed base. It doesn't really matter what we set its dimensions to be to begin with. Um, then we'll just save this. So I'll go here. I'll save it. I'll name it base and I'll actually create a folder saying SolidWorks design spring damper. And it's just going to be our base. doesn't matter. Uh, we'll create a new part. This is going to be our actual mass of the analysis. So I'm going to set it to be exactly the same dimensions and you'll understand later why. So I'll even leave a note for myself here saying explain, explain why the dimensions of base and mass are the same. So we're going to go here, sketch, make sure inch, pound, seconds, because that's just one that we're going with. We'll go here, define it to be seven and seven. Constrain it because that's just good practice. Make sure it's fully black. And then we'll extrude it. We'll just make this something a little larger. It doesn't even matter still. So I'll just make it maybe 10 inches. No, 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 no. I'll make it seven. We'll make it a cube. Cube is seven inches. We'll save this as our mass object. Okay, while I'm here, I could edit it further, but I'm just gonna edit it all in assembly just to get it all together. So now we'll create a new assembly. You don't really have to create your spring. If you do, you can get greater detail and analysis, but this is, we're just gonna use a simulation spring. So it's not gonna like directly affect our masses, but it will, it will in a sense. Uh, I shift click it, shift clicked both materials here so I can import both because if, let's say if I only click on one, I'll only be able to import the single object I selected. So I made sure that I, I shift or control and you can collect both. There's our mass. I'm going to select our base. And that's it. As you can see, there's already an issue with what I wanted. I wanted our base to be our fixed wheel in a sense in our simulation, but it's free moving and our mass that's supposed to be 
changing uh, what is it displacement is fixed that's indicated on this left side screen with an F representing that it's fixed so what I can do is I can right click click float I can freely move it right click click fix and now the base is no longer being able to move okay now we're gonna go and set up some cam mates so what I said before if you see here uh, I'm trying to explain the difference between cam mates and actual uh, contact constraints so cam mates are something you don't usually see but you use to create like saying okay I only want this to move in this certain way or be connected in this certain way so that's like a super idealized version of what you want so I'll go to mates select these two faces uh, coincide so that they're in contact with another I'll select these two as well and now it is perfectly going to only move vertically with one another but it will like blend through but that's an issue we can fix through contacts so we've already set our mates our constraints we'll go here I'm actually gonna go here and go to motion analysis I already have motion analysis uh, selected but if you don't you can go to tools add-ins and then select SolidWorks Motion and I have it on startup so it always starts up for me so then once you have that selected you can go here to animation go to motion analysis and now you are in motion analysis now we're actually going to do some of the uh, representation that we want to simulate of our car so what we'll do is start tweaking some of the settings so personally for me I want to see this in a higher frame rate so frames per second if you guys don't know what that is it just shows the smoothness of your animation so I'm going to set it to 50 because the higher you set this the uh, smoother it is but the longer it will take to calculate it I'll say set it to precise contact so that's just gonna like SolidWorks be like okay I'll be extra careful make sure everything is like really represented and I can give it higher accuracy but I won't for now because that can lead to some issues. Uh, next, I'm going to add gravity because realistically, you have gravity. As you can see in our axis coordinate here, our Ys are vertical. So I'm going to actually set our gravity in the Y direction. The screen arrow shows me it's pointing down, which is what I want. Selected, good to go. So now we just have a mass and gravity. But if I actually run the calculation for, let's say, just like three seconds, goes right through. We don't want that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go here to contact, select both my components. I'm going to give them uh, steel. And then we can see how that actually plays along with one another. So I'll recalculate it. Steel, boom, comes into contact and they're flush with one another, which is great. So another thing I could do is I can even edit this and I think it'll give it some bounce. So if I edit the contact, oh, I deleted it. So sorry. <laughs> I'll edit the contact, I'll make it dry rubber, and you'll actually see it give some bounce, which is cool. Yeah. And then we can even rep uh, represent some reaction forces that it might feel. So, yeah. Now we're going to actually change it back, give it dry steel. We're going to go here, go to the beginning where our displacement was higher, and give it a spring. So what we're going to do here, select the faces of where the spring is restricted to. So now we have a digital representation of our spring. We can give it a spring constant of, let's say, 50 pounds per inch. And you can even give it a dampener. So that usually, so basically your spring is like a... I don't want to say shock absorber, but something that keeps displacement uh, to where you want it to be. So it will just fight the urge of gravity in a sense. And then just, you know, it's it's freely moving and just shaking the vibration and displacement. And the dampener actually is like an energy absorber. So it will actually take the energy that the spring feels. And there you go, snowing. And uh, just quickly... Uh, settle its displacement to where it needs to be so I can actually show that real quick I'll run that calculation with the spring it vibrates I can go and map out that displacement by clicking on the graph symbol we'll go to forces reaction forces 
I'll set in the Y component because that's what, that's what's being acted on. Select the spring. And as you can see, it faces reaction force consistently of 25, but if I run it longer, uh, over time it's gonna reduce because that's naturally what it does. Like it wants to settle. Uh, if I add the, if I edit the spring component and add a dampener, let's say I just give it one. Recalculate it. You can see it's not vibrating at all. And if I actually just map out the plot, it has an initial reaction force of 17 pounds and then dies out because the energy is quickly dissipated in this system. So that just shows you in your suspension system, in your vehicle, your spring is usually what gives you that displacement to make sure that you are steady, but your dampener is the shock absorber to prevent you from your vehicle constantly shaking. So you need both in your system. And typically what you find in the car, I think was like 0.25 of a dampening coefficient. And then the spring, I'm not entirely sure. So I can go here, edit the feature, 0.25, and then just keep that the same. Recalculate it. Show the plot, it vibrates a little bit longer and then steadies out over time. I think at point, like 1.2 seconds, it dies out and it stays where you want it to go. So this is almost like an initial bump in the road. So it's initially displaced and then it just slowly shakes into what you need it to be. So the higher the dampening coefficient, the quicker it is that your car is gonna settle after that initial impact. Okay. Now, let's analyze, let's make this more similar to what we'll see in our vehicle. Now, what we realize is this perfect condition set by CanMate, so there's no physical restrictions or contacts. So what I can do is now edit this to let's let's do this in two ways. Let's first do the one where I edit the components to show the second ideal way to constrict this. And then I'm going to start adding the properties of an actual car to see what closely matches to what we see in real life. So now, boom, move on to the next constriction that looks just like this. So we're going to go back into the model. We're going to edit these components separately. So I can right click on either one. I can hit on edit component. I'll save the assembly. And then we're going to edit this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new sketch, click on there. Normal to sketch. I'll add a circle. I'll line myself up with the center mate, the center of lines. And you'll see a very faded dotted line that represents the vertical center line of the square. I'll go on the horizontal. And as you can see, uh, there's like a yellow square to represent it. And then now we have a center line for the circle. So what happened was, I don't know if you realized it, but there was a square dot that's visible here. And then as I went over the next one, both were visible. So then I was able to use both to create that center point. Another thing you can do is that you can just set center lines to both mid midpoints. And then you can click control click and just make them equal so that uh, you now have the center of your square to add the circle. I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna make it one inch diameter. I'm gonna extrude it, we're gonna maybe extrude it to be 10 inches. And then you can see displaces here. Uh, now we've already edited our component here. Now we'll go into this component now. Right click, edit our mass. We'll go and to the surface. Actually, no, it's this one right here. We'll edit our existing sketch to add that center hole. So we'll go normal to it. Line's already there for us to use, which is perfect. So we can click the center. It'll automatically want to go there. We can edit and it'll automatically create the hole for us so we don't have to worry. So now we have this other constraint. Since our cam mates aren't really, now this is the difference where cam mates can be used uh, in a different way just to create initial conditions. So 
sometimes the center line is like these aren't going to be matching exactly the same and geometrically but you still want there to be uh, some consistency between the holes so your mates can be used to give your initial conditions and then you can just suppress them later on in your design so right now they're perfectly centered now I can go here suppress them because they're no longer needed create a new motion analysis and now we have free to move one but I, that's not what I wanted so it's already centered so I don't have to worry about that I'm going to give the initial constraints again contacts oh sorry I'm not even in motion analysis yet we have gravity going to contacts I'm gonna give these steel greasy so that it's easy to move. I'll make I'll even make it different. I'll make it steel dry for now. Add a spring between these two. I'll give it a diameter of let's say two inches so you can see it. Fifty pound inches. Give it a dampener 0.25. And we don't have a material for this. I don't believe. So I'll actually give it a new material here and I'll just give it alloy steel. We have gravity, we have contacts uh, between them and how they'll act. We can edit the system, give it precise contact, run the simulation. I can now graph the reaction force of the spring as you can see it feels an initial uh, reaction force of 170 uh, pound force so another way I can check that it, uh, edit this to be more realistic is actually edit the mass so car let's say is 2,000 pounds each wheel feels 400 pounds of weight now let's edit that tweak it to be exactly what we want so we're gonna go here we're gonna go to evaluate we're going to mass properties deselect the assembly select our mass overwrite the mass and let's say what is that 2000 divided by 4 that's like 500 pounds so we're gonna say this is one wheel uh, the four the weight that one wheel or one spring under one wheel feels so it's gonna be 500 pounds so let's review our initial conditions of our spring. Our spring has a spring constant coefficient of 50 pound, uh, pounds of force per inch that I can displace. And let's say our dampener is 0.25 pound inches per second. So it reduces the acceleration by that much over time, therefore dissipates as much energy as it can. So this is very low. My prediction is the spring isn't gonna handle this at all. It's just gonna collapse. So if I run the calculation, straight collapse then decompresses so let's wait let's wait let's wait let's wait I'm gonna wait one whole second then I'm gonna stop the simulation and just show you what the reaction force of the spring is so let's wait plot the results feels the reaction force of 430 uh, pounds of force drops to negative 521 of a reaction force and then comes back up to about 500 to maybe what is that consistent 500 pounds of force that it feels yeah about so what is happening here my belief or my hypothesis you guys can come up with your own is that the dampener is what helped dissipate a lot of that energy the spring came back from compression and then the spring just feels the 500 pounds of force that it consistently feels over time so if I go back erase the dampener recalculate okay that's enough for now yeah okay that's strange okay now that didn't do much if I'm being honest but the spring just de uh, uncompresses after a little bit so I'm gonna go back I'll edit it my guess is as good as you yours 
I'm gonna go here and edit it to give it a hundred and edit the spring to be about 500 pounds of force. Go back to the beginning, recalculate. If I show the plot, so what happens is the spring, the weight just compresses the spring slightly so it reduces, but then it feels a constant force of around 500 pounds. So that's just super steady. We basically went over, uh, what is it, like one bump, but then it automatically went back to its initial state. If I change my dampening coefficient to be 0.25, we're more likely to see a consistent spring. So the energy in the system is being conserved and it's always vibrating. So let's actually rerun it. Yep. If I go back, show plot the energy is being consistent and we actually feel a greater reaction force of like a thousand pounds of force on our spring. So that, as you can see, the dampener not only reduces the energy and dissipates the energy in the system, it actually reduces wear on your springs in your car. So your springs are there to keep you perfectly displaced, but your dampener is there to reduce the load and quickly bring you back to an equilibrium spot. So what we want in our car is usually something with a high coefficient of dampening so that we go to equilibrium super quickly so I'll say 50 and let's say spring is still displacement let's actually reduce it let's say 400 pounds of force per inch yep let me actually reduce it even more actually so I'll go to edit I'll put this at 10 And this is something you typically see in a vehicle more likely. Like you would see a little bit of a bounce. It'll be a huge reaction force, but it'll dissipate so that the springs just feel the weight of the vehicle itself and it can handle itself. Now let's actually start adding bumps into our analysis. So I'll go here. I'll put a motor, a linear motor acting on the surface, acting down on our mass. We'll have it oscillate one inch per second. Uh, maybe even, let's just say, Five hertz of a frequency so like every five seconds or what is it no I think it's 0.25 rerun the calculation and then we have more consistency of 400 pounds of force to zero and then I can actually run it to show you where it feels zero right there there so what is that that is actually our peak that is when our spring is completely uncompressed and is actually being stretched out so almost like the momentum of the spring pushing it back up and it just the spring isn't feeling any weight at all the car is just being lifted up and then I believe the 400 pounds is where it is fully compressed yeah this is one good way that we can analyze the stresses of our weight of our vehicle. So let's actually say we start adding the motor and the uh, batteries. That's like an extra thousand pounds on top of that. So what is that? 3,000 pounds divided by four. Let's see. 750. So if we go back, mass properties, select our mass. So let's just say these are initial conditions of our car and our spring can only handle that maximum load. Uh, so if we go here, these are conditions of our spring and dampening system. We'll recalculate it. And now what we'll observe on our spring is a greater reaction force or not. Yeah, no, it handles it pretty well. Oh, only because of the linear motor. So if I unsuppress that, or I suppress that, recalculate it. And over one bump, we feel a reaction force of 1,200 pounds. So way greater than we expected before we saw maybe 900 pounds of force. So that's like one bump. But yeah, I don't have the answers to everything. This is just something that is a work in progress. Tutorial on that. And you can get more accurate results based off of more accurate models. But yeah, this is just like something quick you can do.